Scheduling your bash scripts to run at a time in the future. A topic so nice, you just gotta do it twice. Actually, in the previous video, we took a look at scheduling jobs, but I have more to teach you around these concepts, so I'm going to teach you even more about the topic in this video. And actually, let's just go ahead and dive right in. And right here in front of me, I have the actual script that we used in the previous lesson. We're not going to create a new script this time around, we're going to use the exact same script. And the difference in this lesson is we're going to see how to schedule this via cron instead of at like we did before. But before we go any further, there's something important that I'd like to do. There is a change that I would like to make to this script. And the change that I'm going to make is not really specific to cron. I mean, it kind of is. I'll get into that in a moment. But for the most part, it's just a best practice, something that technically we should have been doing for a while. And what I want to do is make sure that I'm using fully qualified commands in my scripts. So for example, here we have echo. And echo is actually located at user, bin, and then echo. So the fully qualified path for the echo command is user bin echo. Now if I go over here to the date command, the fully qualified command for that is going to be user bin date. Just like that. And I'll minimize this for now, because what I want to do is go over how I found out what the path actually is for a command. So for example, I could type which echo, and that gives me the fully qualified command for echo. Fully qualified means instead of just typing echo, I'm typing the full path to that command. And then for date, we have user bin date. Now the which command is very useful in figuring out whether or not a command is available. If a command is available, if it's recognized by the shell, then the which command will print the full path to that particular command. If it's not recognized, well, the which command won't print anything at all. Now on your end, you should have both echo and date. I haven't actually seen a situation where those commands have to be installed, so you should definitely have those on your Linux system without needing to download anything. Anyway, we went ahead and changed our script to include fully qualified commands, and I recommend that you do that going forward. It's probably okay on most distributions to use only the command itself without the path, but it's considered a bad practice to not include the full path to the command. And there's two reasons for this. One reason is security, and the other relates to your path variable. Since we're about to run this script via a cron job, we want to use the full path to the commands that we're using in our script, because depending on how your Linux distro is set up, it may not have the path variable set up in the same way as others, and it might not actually be able to find the commands. Now, even though the shell is able to find the commands no problem while we're running things, you know, manually, when it runs overnight, it might not be using the same shell environment, it might not have the same path variable. So what that would mean is that if you had simply echo and simply date in the script, and if the user actually doesn't have that path in their path variable when it's run, then the script will actually fail. Now you might be wondering, well, why would that be the case? If I'm able to run the echo command and the date command manually without actually typing the full path, then why would cron need the full path, whereas it's not needed when I'm doing it manually? Well, the thing is, when a job runs via cron, and I'll show you how to create a cron job later on in this lesson, when that actually runs a job, it might not run in the standard shell environment, so the path variable might not actually be the same as it is when you're doing this manually. Now, most of the time, this doesn't matter. Most distributions are fairly consistent, that if something works somewhere, it's going to work somewhere else as well. But it's a good habit to get into to type the fully qualified paths to commands, because every now and then, you might actually see a failure if you don't. This hasn't actually impacted us yet in this course, but it is something that might impact you as you go along and as you learn. So what I would do is just get in the habit of typing out the fully qualified paths right now, so that way you minimize the chances that you're going to run into this problem later on. Now, I also mentioned a security concern as well, and this can be a more important reason to use fully qualified commands. In this script, I'm running echo as well as date. But what if a person, a person that's not very nice, creates a script that's also named echo or date. But instead of that script being the actual echo or date commands, perhaps that script is just named echo or just named date, 
But instead of actually being the real thing, maybe that script actually wipes out everything on your file system. For example, if I had a script called date in my current working directory, and that script did some damage to the server, and I only had permission to run the date command, or whatever the script name happens to be, if a very bad person names their malicious software the same as what I'm trying to run, then technically, I am running something I have permission to run. The name matches, but it's not quite the same thing. When I type user bin echo, then that's actually narrowing it down to the actual echo command on the system. So if there was, I don't know, home j echo, well, that's not what I'm running. I'm running user bin echo specifically. Now, to be fair, if a user has full access to the system, then they could literally replace the echo command with their script and that would still defeat us. But then again, if they were able to gain root privileges, then that means we have bigger problems in the script. Anyway, I digress. When in doubt, use the fully qualified command. That's always better. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at cron jobs. I mean, that's the entire reason why we are even watching this lesson. So let's make sure that we get to the topic at hand. What I'm going to do right now is edit my cron tab. And the way that I'll do that is I'll type the cron tab command and then the option dash E. Dash E represents edit. And when I press enter, the first time it's probably going to ask me which text editor I want to use. Normally, I like to use Vim, but in this case, I'll just go along with Nano since that's what we've been using. Once you do this, you actually shouldn't see this come up the next time. But anyway, once you select your editor, if it hasn't already been selected, you'll then be brought into a crontab file. Now notice at the top of the screen that this file is in temp slash TMP. That's where your temp files are. The crontab itself is not inside that TMP directory, but the crontab dash E command, what that's going to do is allow us to edit the crontab file in temp, not the real thing. We're going to make our changes and then save it. And then what's going to happen is if it's a valid command, if we have no typos, at least as far as the crontab command is aware of, then it's going to be accepted and the file will be saved in the place where it actually is supposed to be. Now, by default, it's very common that a cron tab will have a bunch of comments like you see here. It's practically an entire page. There's a lot of information here. Now, this information is actually important. It's telling you exactly how cron jobs are structured. Now, I'm going to explain it myself, but it's often the case that some people might want to retain these comments, especially when they're learning, because there could be some helpful hints in here that you might need later. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that I entered the command crontab-e to get to this file right here. By executing a command with crontab-e, and you know, you're not using sudo or anything like that, then that means you're editing the crontab of the user that you're currently logged in as. So if I set up a job to run as my user, then that's not going to impact a job that someone else runs. Everyone is able to run their own jobs. So what I'm going to do is create a cron job right here. I'm going to type it out. And then I'll explain exactly what I'm doing and how you can understand what a cron tab line actually looks like. It follows a very specific format that I'll be going over. And there it is. So what I'm doing here is I am running a script that is located in user local bin, and we haven't actually copied the script over there yet, so this won't actually run. But starting off at the left-hand side, what exactly is going on here? Well, first of all, it's very common with a cron tab file when you're creating a new one to have all these comments like you see on my screen. And often the last comment will be a sort of legend for how to understand the structure of a cron tab line. Now, each of these options here are separated by a space. So I have 30, that's the first option, space, one, that's the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So we know that a particular section is over if we see a space. Now up here, we kind of do see that legend, don't we? So right away, M is for minute. So this particular job right here is going to run when the minute is at 30. So 1.30, 2.30, 3.30, anytime the minute section of the clock is at 30, then this script will run. But as we move to the right, we're actually narrowing this down a bit further. Here for the hour, I have one. And this is in military time. So now what we can glean from this is that this particular job will run at 1.30. You see here M for minute, H for hour. That's exactly what I have. I have 30 for the minute section and one for the hour section. 
Next, we have the day of the month. And the day of the month can be anywhere from 1 to 31. If you have an asterisk here, that means it doesn't matter when it comes to that field. That field is not a deciding factor in whether or not this particular job runs. So in this case, we don't care what the day of the month is. We just want it to run. Now, if I was to type, I don't know, 10 right here, then this script is going to run March 10th, April 10th, May 10th, and so on. But since I have an asterisk here, well, then that doesn't matter. Next, we have the month, and that could be 1 through 12. And this allows us to narrow down the job by which month we want it to run in. Maybe we have a script that runs quarterly, maybe something that runs every month, every two months. This field here gives you the option of setting the month that you actually want this to run in. Next, we have the day of the week. 5 is Friday. Now keep in mind that both 0 and 7 represent Sunday. So if you type 0 here, that's Sunday. If you type 7, that's Sunday. 1 is Monday, 2 is Tuesday, 3 is Wednesday, and so on. So here I have 5 for Friday. And finally, we have the full path to the script. So what we can tell from this script right here is that this script is going to run every Friday at 1.30 in the morning and when it kicks off, it's going to run user local bin script or whatever you want to call your script. So now we have a weekly task set up right here. Now, if I was to change the five to an asterisk, that means it's going to run every day at 1.30. If I replace the one with an asterisk, that means every hour. So at that point, only the minute section actually matters. So every time the minute section of the clock reads 30, then this entire thing is going to execute and of course, we just narrow it down further by filling out any fields we want to narrow it down by. So I could run it at 3.30 in the morning. Maybe the 10th of the month. But only in July. And then only if that particular date falls on a Thursday. So this script is barely ever going to run. Some very specific set of criteria is required here for the script to run. So the more that you narrow this down, the less frequently the script will actually kick off. So what I'm going to do right now is save the file. And we can see there the verbiage is crontab installing new crontab. But since we use the crontab utility, then actually that means that crontab is checking the syntax. And if everything is okay, within reason, it's not perfect, it's going to go ahead and install the new crontab. And by not perfect, I mean that syntactically what we did was correct, but that script doesn't actually exist. So even though crontab is not detecting the error, there might still be an error that it didn't detect. In this case, the file isn't present. We would want to make sure that we do copy the script over to that location because we have a cron job for it. We want to make sure that everything checks out. So is there a way to edit a crontab for another user? Well, absolutely. You can run sudo crontab-e just like before. But what we could also do is dash u for user, and we could type the username right here. So if I had another user on the server named Bob, for example, then I could edit his cron tab with this command. I'm using sudo because I need root privileges in order to edit someone else's cron job. Now, of course, there's more to cron than this, but I think what I've gone over is enough to help you schedule jobs. What I recommend is that you use the cron tab to schedule a job for, I don't know, maybe five minutes from now, and make sure that your script actually runs. Once you get the hang of this, you'll be able to schedule scripts to run anytime you'd like. And that's actually extremely helpful on servers, because I don't know about you, I'd rather not wake up at three in the morning to run a script. If it could be run in the middle of the night, and then I could check it when I get into work the next day, I think that's better because sleep is important. If nothing else, just practice with Cron a little bit longer, and then when you're ready, I will see you in the next lesson. So there you go. This video is all set, and with this video being all set, we've finished going over concepts around scheduling jobs. In the next video, we're going to take a look at arguments in Bash, and I can't wait to show you, so as soon as you're ready for that particular lesson, I'll meet you in that video. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you.